Okay, let's go back to Titus this morning one last time. And uh, we'll finish this series. This will be the fourth message in this series, Not by Works of Righteousness, Part 4. I hope and I pray uh, that what we have preached on and taught in the previous three messages have been some comfort and encouragement to you as children of God. You know, that's one of the things that I'm very keenly aware of every time I step into the pulpit, uh, the, the gospel minister's uh, purpose is for the comfort and encouragement of God's children. I think about Isaiah, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith the Lord. I don't want any of God's children to go away discouraged and disheartened, distraught, even though we are often distraught in heart, mind, and soul as we have to deal with our remaining sinfulness. But the, the true preacher of God, the one who declares Christ and his righteousness alone, always points God's people to the appropriate place for comfort and security, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as Paul has been pointing out to this young preacher, Titus, the, the message uh, that is essential for us to preach. Now, you wouldn't think you'd have to stress those things, but we have a tendency to get off base. We get on to subjects and thoughts and ideas that are of little or no importance at all. And we miss the grand central theme of who Christ is, what he accomplished, where he is now. Yeah, you know, if there's one truth, and I went back over and I looked at all that I've said over the previous three messages, looking at these words to this young preacher, Titus, but if there's one truth that the Apostle Paul has made clearly and dogmatically, that he set forth in what he's written in these verses that we've been looking at, it's this, and this is the thing we have to keep in mind. God the Father saved us. He didn't give a stab at it. He didn't give it his best shot. He saved us. Whoever us is, it's a certain. It's a surety. It's something we can take comfort and take encouragement in. In other words, you think about this. God the Father is the source, and he's the originator of salvation for those the triune God determined to save before the foundation of the world. Listen to it. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, this is God the Father, according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now listen to me. This truth that resounds throughout all eternity and all time is the comfort and encouragement for God's children. For God so loved the world. Now, you know what that verse means if you're a child of God. If you're an unregenerate, religious, moral person, you think that word world means everybody. God didn't send Christ here for Judas Iscariot. He didn't send him here for any of the vessels of wrath that were fitted for destruction from before the foundation of the world. God loved his people. And because of that great love, what did he do? He sent Christ. Why? It was required. It was necessary. It was the only thing by which God could be just and justify the ungodly. But here's what I want to point out to you. And I, I, I told somebody on the phone the other day that you know, I, as I've gone through this, I, I want to be very careful in the way I state these things because I don't want to ever do any dishonor to any part of our triune God, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. But you think about this. We have to keep in mind when we look at passages like this and passages throughout the Scripture, we have to keep in mind that in this matter of salvation, this matter of eternal life of sinners, all three persons of the Godhead, all three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they all had an essential role in 
That's exactly what Paul set forth in those verses we read this morning in the call to worship in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through verse 14. Each person of the Godhead has a distinct role and a specific work. God the Father, who justifieth the ungodly, I might add, his role was what? To purpose and to plan salvation, choosing according to his sovereign will and purpose a multitude of sinners. I almost said guilty sinners, but according to what Romans 9 tells us, it was before they did any good or any evil. God chose a multitude of sinners according to his sovereign will and purpose, and he gave them to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as their surety and substitute, representative. God the Son willingly humbled himself as the second person of the Trinity, taking unto him the role of what? The suffering servant of Jehovah. Becoming obedient unto death, according to what Philippians tells us, even the death of the cross, the cross we, the death we deserve. He was sent by the Father to glorify and honor the Father by the work that he would accomplish. And did he do it? He said he did. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. Is salvation for sure? It's as sure as the one who spoke those words. Even our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. God the Holy Spirit, though co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Son, He too took a role of submission. Christ submitted Himself to the will of the Father. The Holy Spirit submitted Himself to the will of the Father and to the will of the Son, taking a place of submission Never speaking of himself. That's one thing. Yeah, you hear people in our day, we had a Holy Spirit revival. No, you didn't. Uh-uh. He, according to the script, he will not speak of himself. Never, ne Listen, the Holy Spirit never one time in Acts, or any point in history, anything that the apostles wrote, ever points to him. Who does he point to? The Son. Never pointing to himself. Pointing all of God's children to the same place. Where? The Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Howbeit, our Lord said, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself. And when you hear people that are religious talking about what the Holy Spirit's done in me, that's... Not what Christ has done for them, it's what the Holy Spirit's done through them. That's what most people are trapped in. He will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear. That shall he speak. He will show you things to come. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He shall glorify me. Why? Christ said, Now if I be lifted up, I be exalted, be glorified, I will draw all unto me. For he shall receive of mine. And what's he going to do? What's his role? To show everything about Christ to me. For his people. I, preacher, that's deep. That ain't deep. It's what I just read to you in Ephesians 1. And I'll tell you what, these glorious God-exalting truths, they aren't mere high doctrines to be rolled around in our head, to be debated about, and to be discussed as matters of curiosity. You know what these, those things I just told you are, the work of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and this plan of salvation? These are the essential truths. You hear me? These are the essential truths which all God's redeemed. How many of them? All God's redeemed. No. They believe. They rejoice in while in this world. Seeing they've been taught of God. 
Listen to what he said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. We read it, but listen to it. Pay attention to it. This is what God the Holy Spirit does for the child of God. Wherein he hath abounded toward us. Who? Those that God the Father blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He hath abounded toward us in all, how much? All wisdom and prudence. Having, listen to this, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. I'm telling you, if God purposes for you to know it, you know what you're going to do? You're going to know it. They shall be all taught of God. Now, the apostle Paul had told Titus, as well as all who would read this letter, that God the Father is the one who, according to his mercy, saved us by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And as I told you last week, before God regenerates and converts his elect by the Holy Spirit under the preaching of God's gospel, they have absolutely no comprehension of any of God's saving mercy. None of it. But when God the Holy Spirit gives spiritual life to the spiritually dead sinner, Paul declares this. Look at, look at our text here at verse 6 which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The original word translated he shed means to bestow or to distribute largely. Now let that sink in, to bestow or distribute largely. And it's a verb. Again, I did not pay close enough attention in school. I wish I had them when the English teachers were teaching me. But I can read and understand what verbs mean. And I know verbs have a voice and they have a tense. And they got something else. Sue will help me out. They have, they have, they have tense and further. They have tense. They have voice. Well, there's three things that they got. See, I don't even remember that. But I do know this. Tense is important. The tense of a verb is important. And especially when you're talking about the Greek tenses of verbs. Because this is a verb that's used here, translated he shed. And it's in what's called the aorist tense. And in the aorist tense, it, it, it basically, the aorist tense in Greek is similar to our past tense, just in the English, whatever past tense means. What? It's something that's occurred. It's an event that's happened. So in other words, think, look, listen to this. God has freely bestowed, or he has largely distributed. What's he largely distributed on every object of his love? His mercy. His mercy. On every one of those that he regenerates and converts, according to verse 5, by God the Holy Spirit. That word translated abundantly means richly. He has bestowed are distributed largely and richly, his mercy. Paul used that same word, and this, this, this just thrilled me when I ran up on this this week. Here's the same word, translated abundantly here, means richly. Here's how rich it is. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was, here's the word, rich. How rich was he? He needed nothing. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes. Now think about that. He was abundantly rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you, through his poverty, here's the same word, might be rich. Whatever one of God's children, they're rich in mercy. Whose mercy? God's mercy. Here's the same word again. But God who is rich, abundant in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Think about that, what that means to you and me as sinners. God freely and richly bestows his mercy on his elect when he regenerates them, 
and converts them in order for them to be comforted and encouraged in his mercy and in his grace. One verse that just constantly stays in this old head is what was written in Lamentations. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. How, do I, how can I as a sinner have hope? <laughs> recall this to mind. It's of the Lord's mercies. What? It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His compassions fail not. They are new. They are fresh every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That's how I can hope. <laughs> like I said in the last message, the greatest of all miracles is what God does for every object of his eternal love by bestowing on them spiritual, eternal life. But here's what's so important in all this. He said he shed all of this abundantly on us. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Don't have anything to do with me. It's through Jesus Christ our Lord. Think about it. Every mercy... All grace, the work of redemption, the work of justification, the work of regeneration, the gift of faith and repentance, the gift of sanctification, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, all of them are through Christ Jesus our Lord. With no conditions on you at any time, to any degree, in any way. I'm not going to read it again, but think back to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Think about what he said. There are absolutely no blessings outside of Christ, not any, based on his accomplished work as the God sent Messiah. I love, I, I, one of my favorite commentator, and I don't agree with him on everything. I mean, me and him have our differences, but one of my favorite commentators, actually, he's kind of slid down the scale behind Mr. Hawker, but I still love John Gill. Only thing I got a problem with John Gill, John Gill has a tendency to be too wordy. You say, well, you ought to know something about wordy, Brother Richard. <laughs> but he's too wordy for me. And if I'm wordy, and I say he's too wordy, Mr. Hawker can say in one sentence what John Gill will say in two paragraphs. But I do like what John Gill wrote on this passage. He said, The love and kindness of God the Father, our Savior, comes through Jesus Christ. The mercy of God streams through him. The salvation itself is by and through him. The grace communicated in regeneration and conversion is out of his fullness. The Spirit himself is given forth from him. And every supply of grace by which the work is carried on comes out of Christ's hands and everything wrought in us that is well-pleasing in the sight of God is through him and even the gift of God, eternal life itself is where? In Christ. If you have the Son, you've got life. If you have not the Son, you have not life. I believe Paul summed it up best. For all the promises of God are in him, in Christ. What? Yes, and in him, so be it. Amen. To the glory of God by us. But look at the next word. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let me read you a literal translation of this verse. That having been declared righteous by his grace, heirs we may become according to the hope of the life age during. According to these verses, as well as the narrative of the whole of Scripture, the same God who revealed his kindness and love, the same God who sent his Son, the same God who according to his mercy saved us, folks, he's the same God who justified us. Who? God the Father. 
This word translated being justified is correctly translated appropriately in that verse that I read you. It literally means to declare or pronounce one to be just, one to be righteous, one to be, declare them to be as they ought to be. Let that sink in. Because here's the question. Who declares those who are by nature sinners just or righteous? Who does it? Well, let the scriptures be your guide. See, that's, that's the thing. Paul told those at Rome, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And he answers that question I just asked you. Who's the only one that can declare a sinner just or righteous? It is God. It is God that justifies. Now, again, I, to me, when we talk about these things like this, th this is holy ground, and I want to be as careful as I possibly can be when I make the statement that I'm about to make because I don't want to interject my opinion or my thoughts, or my ideas, I want to interpret Scripture with Scripture. That's what I want to do. Folks, it's God the Father that justifies the ungodly. He declares them righteous. Now, that does no dishonor to the Son. Christ was raised again for our justification. We'll get to that in just a moment. But God the Father, in His court, He's the one who declares or pronounces sinners righteous, declares us to be holy and acceptable in His sight. That's the God that Abraham believed. For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness, and to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him who justify, who declares righteous the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And that faith is not his believing. His faith is the object, Christ. Even as David also describes the blessedness of that man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Our text declares definitively and dogmatically that having been declared righteous by his grace. Our knowledge of this blessed state that we are declared righteous by the Father is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit at our regeneration and conversion. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, Paul writes, but we've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. Now listen to this language. And I've got it highlighted and underlined and in parentheses in my note. That we are not we're going to become when we believe. The Spirit sent forth into our heart testifies to our spirit, what are you? You're a son. You're, a child. You're the children of God. He told those at Galatia, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them which are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of son. Here it is again. And because you are sons... Because you are a son, God has sent forth the spirit of his son. Because you're his sons, <laughs> he sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. And now what do you do? We can't even, we, Kenny said we don't know what we pray, don't know how to pray. We don't know how to cry right. Huh? Mr. Hawker said this, justification which is an act of God, and I do agree with that wholeheartedly, it's an act of God, conceived in the eternal purpose of God from all eternity, and by which the person of his elect are accepted in Christ as justified freely by Christ's blood and righteousness, this immense mercy also is his people's right of enjoyment at regeneration. 
Remember what Paul said in Acts 13? Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that by this man, what's preached to you this morning? The forgiveness of sin. And by him, by this person who through forgiveness of sin comes, by him, all believe, all that believe are justified. They, they, you know, I tell you, you need to look at the words. Although, all, it literally is all believing are declared righteous. Are they all righteous? Who could not be justified, how? By the law of Moses. But notice what is it's revealed to all those who are justified, sanctified, and saved by God's grace in Christ. We should be made heirs. We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That English phrase, we should be made, is one word in the original which means to become. That is to say to come into existence or begin to be or receive being. Folks, we become heirs not because of our believing, not because of our faithfulness, and certainly not because of any good work. We're made heirs because of our being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Listen again to Mr. Hawker. He says this, And as the apostle here speaks, being justified by His grace, they are made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. All these blessings begin to open upon the soul Neither can they ever after close, but extend more and more to the view under divine teaching by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit. Paul said the wages of sin, death. But the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Folks, by God's grace in Christ Jesus, we are heirs of God and join heirs of Christ. But notice what he says next to Titus. This, look at verse 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou constantly affirm. And this, this is where everybody gets so confused. They jump on this part of this verse. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good work. And they think that's what that faithful saying is. And that's, what, that's what's worthy, that's what needs to be affirmed constantly, that you be faithful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. My question is this, what's the faithful saying? What's those things God the Holy Spirit encouraged Titus and all those of God's servants and his children in every generation to constantly affirm. What are we to affirm? Here it is. But after that, the kindness of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Yet remember, be careful to maintain good work. What's he said in the verse before? Let, let Scripture interpret Scripture. Not by works of righteousness which we've done. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing and regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he has shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Folks, this is exactly what Paul's referring to. These are the things that we should constantly affirm. That's exactly what Paul did in his ministry. That's what he meant when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, Save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But the thing that I find so astonishing about the way he writes this here is that all of God's elect who have believed in God, because he says that, that you're to admonish those, keep these things before those who have believed in God, encourage them to do what? Maintain good works. But I find it interesting that all those who believe in God, who've been given an understanding that they're sons of God, daughters of God, that they're one with Christ, that they're righteous, they have to be constantly admonished to be careful 
to maintain good works. But we do. We do. But here's the thing. The greatest encouragement and motive to be careful to maintain good works, what is it? It's a certain assurance of those things Paul's already admonished Titus to affirm constantly. King David declared it like this, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark my iniquities, you write my sins down against me. O oh, Lord, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with thee. What? There's wrath against you. No, there is forgiveness with thee. That thou mayest be reverenced. Feared. I tell you, none fear the Lord like those who've been forgiven. No, they just don't. I'm telling you. John declared it like this. We love him. Why do you love the Lord? He first loved me, in spite of myself. I couldn't help but think of the words in an old hymn that we sing every once in a while, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. One of the verses goes like this, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. But Paul closes it out with this. These things are good and profitable unto man. But these things, folks, aren't talking about our good works. Whatever, I, that's the thing I can't even get anybody to truly define to me from the scriptures. What is a good work? It's not talking about our good work, even though the works of God's children, you know what? They are good works because they're in, through, and by Christ. And most of whatever we do that's good works, it's good and profitable to men. But that's not what he's talking about because we know this much too that corrupt communications, even a believer's, what does it do? It corrupts good manners. Now it does. So what's he talking about that's good and profitable to the elect? Because he said it's good and profitable unto men. Not all men, men. God's elect. It's God's doctrine. The doctrine of Christ. He delivers to his people in every generation that gospel by which he delivers his people from the law of sin and death in whom you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom after you heard, what did you do? You believe. And after you believe, what? You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. These things are the good and, that are good and profitable to men are the doctrines of Christ, which are good and profitable to all those for whom Christ is the mediator. But look at verse 9 and we'll quit right here. Notice the contrast. But avoid. Now he says these things are good and profitable to all men. What? The doctrines of Christ. The gospel. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law because what's the difference? These, they, the, the gospel is profitable and good to all men. But these things, what are they? They're unprofitable. And what else? They're vain. I always think about Solomon. Vanity of vanities. All things are vanity. The only thing that is essential, the only thing that is eternal is the Lord Jesus Christ, both his person and in his work and what he did to glorify and honor the true and living God in his character as both a just God and a Savior. I hope and I pray that these four messages, if you hadn't heard them all, go back and listen to them. I hope that they'll be of comfort and encouragement to you in your walk of faith. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. Lord bless you and keep you till we see you next Lord's Day. Buddy, if you would, dismiss us, please. Father, we thank you now for...